uh, yeah, that was an issue with IoT and battery supplies and unexpected last minute complications, which of course there are many. Uh, so, welcome to our talk, finally. Hmm? What are you? Oh, yeah. Oh. Thank you for coming to the uh, conference auditorium. I'm here to uh, present my friends, Joel Savitz, uh, Grace Chin, and Charlie Mirabile, IoT for Environmental Monitoring. Enjoy the talk. Okay, thank you, Nandan, for that excellent introduction. Now, of course, our first slide is going to be an introduction. So welcome to IoT for Environmental Monitoring. Uh, maybe we should have called it IoT for Climate Change or Climate Science, but it's too late. We already had it on the schedule. So yeah, my name is Joel Savitz. Uh, I am an intern on the uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Core Kernel Generalist Development Team, uh, an undergraduate, undergraduate student at UMass Lowell. Uh, I don't look like the guy in the picture because I am dressed for work. I'm in my, my finest development flip-flops. Yeah, uh, and uh, I previously worked in Dr. Fred Martin's Engaging Computing Group Laboratory, where this project is being developed. So my name is Grace Chin. I also previously worked at um, Engaging Computing Group. Um, that's where I got involved in this project. But currently, I'm um, a co-op intern at Red Hat, and I'm going to let Charlie introduce himself. Hi, I'm Charlie. Uh, I'm a current UMass Lowell student, and I'm currently working at the Engaging Computing Group where this uh, project is being developed. And so I am the lead developer and like lead technical, uh, the technical lead for, for the development on this project. Uh, I'm excited to give you this talk. I'll pass it back to Joel. All right, so this project began as a collaboration between two professors, uh, kind of an interdisciplinary sort of thing. Uh, one, James Heiss, a recent addition to UMass Lowell, uh, a new professor in the Department of Environmental Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, it's his hypothesis that's being tested using sensor networks that we're going to talk about uh, in collaboration with Professor Fred Martin a longtime professor of computer science and the recently promoted to, to the associate dean for student success at the Kennedy College of Sciences. And of course, he is the director of the Engaging Compu uh, Computing Group Research Lab, where this project's being developed. And so this originally began where uh, the Fred Martin has a, a research lab with a bunch of students, and he we had recently finished some similar projects, uh, some IoT related projects and I guess they had been talking and they decided to uh, sort of loan us to James Heiss and that's how this project got started. So this is the right talk for you if you are interested in a couple of different things. Uh, first of all the climate uh, in understanding the way the climate works, uh, the way that we can model it uh, and how we can understand it and the way it's changing in order to actually be able to uh, adapt and react appropriately. As if we don't really know what's going on, we can't even make any decisions on what to do. Uh, of course, it's about the Internet of Things, as our talk's called IoT. Uh, Internet of Things actually made the text wrap way too weirdly, so it's, we just use no. Uh, but of course, you know, they're really just a bunch of little devices connected to the Internet that rely on you know, power and, and standard things. But it's a very nice buzzword, so we use it. And of course, research, testing hypotheses, I mean, Nothing particularly novel about that, except that we're undergraduates, so it's, you know, interesting. Uh, and, of course, human survival. Uh, I mean, usually, originally we were going to say saving the Earth, but then, of course, you realize, you know, it doesn't really matter what we do to the climate. The Earth will be just fine. It's human survival that we actually have to be concerned about. So in this talk, we are going to present you with a, an Arduino sensor network with a couple of very important features. Uh, first of all, that it's open source, of course, as that is you know, the main theme of this talk and this whole development conference. Uh, in order to provide the world with the, the greatest inspectability and make our project of the greatest use to the greatest number of people, uh, we publish all of our source code and all of our ideas online uh, in public uh, with as much documentation as possible, of course. And at the same time, uh, that's a kind of open source on the software side. To provide similar levels of functionality on the hardware side, we aim to make it as low cost as possible. 
by using chips that um, are low cost. I mean, <laughs> and so at the same time, we wanted to keep it extremely scalable, so that you could have uh, you know one data collection node, or you could have you know like a hundred or so ish data collection nodes. I mean, we're going to say like any number, but you know within reason, pretty pretty large number of nodes. And of course, we wanted to keep it flexible, so you can use all sorts of different sensors and different combinations, depending on your precision needs, depending on your power needs, you know, and just depending on what kind of metrics you want to gather. So now I'll just give a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, first, we're going to give you some background on the science behind this project and the original motivations. Uh, then we'll give you an overview of our hardware and the general architecture of the project. Uh, then we'll talk about some of our challenges that we that we currently face, kind of the problems that we're currently trying to overcome. Uh, then we'll talk about our MVP, our minimum viable product, the system that we've been able to construct thus far. And then we'll talk about some of the related work, similar systems that have done similar things with Arduinos for slightly different purposes with slightly different features uh, that we think are lacking in a couple things that we're going to present about. And then we'll discuss our next steps, uh, what we plan to do with the system in terms of testing and deployment. And finally, we will conclude with a brief demonstration of our minimum viable product as it stands today. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Grace, who will give you some overview of the scientific background. So as we probably all know by now, uh, the Earth has gone um, has undergone uh, concerning climate changes um, over the past few decades, and um, these have been determined by scientists to be caused by human activity. And uh, therefore, it's in our best interest to take appropriate action, because as Joel alluded to, uh, if we want to have a chance of surviving as a species, then uh, we need to uh, make some changes. And in order to make those changes, changes. We need to understand what exactly is happening to our oceans, wildlife, beaches, agricultural systems, and more. Um, all of the, the things that you see on the screen right now are related with one another. So if anything bad happens to one of them, then they'll all suffer and ultimately will lose access to resources that we need. Um, so in this particular project, our focus is on understanding beach aquifers. And an aquifer is basically um, an underground layer of rock which contains and transmits water, um, as you can see in the picture. And um, so now I want to talk to you about some um, thing called eutrophication. It's um, a problem that we should all care about. Uh, the problem arises when there is an excess of nutrients um, from farming that leach into the oceans via groundwater. Um, an excess of nutrients can lead to uh, an overgrowth of algae which can block sunlight and cause plants to not uh, uh, have access to sunlight and to die. And when the plants die, the uh, bacteria uh, digest these plants and uh, use up the remaining oxygen in the water um, and replace it with carbon dioxide. And this causes uh, fish and wildlife to uh, become unhealthy and to die without uh, oxygen to breathe. And so um, obviously this is uh, a problem and it has adverse health effects for our ecosystem. Systems. And so one way that we want to um, understand uh, this problem is by keeping track of the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, and so we can see uh, how um, severe, um, severely eutrophic, <laughs> uh, severely <laughs> eutrophicated. Uh, the, the water is, and uh, then we can make appropriate changes to fix that. Um, but not just uh, dissolved oxygen is what we're interested in. We also want to keep track of things like pH, temperature, um, pressure, uh, oxidation reduction potential, which is basically a measure of how um, chemically reactive the water is, and um, 
electrical conductivity, which is the salt content in the water. Um, and so we can um, form these two fundamental uh, research questions, and they are on the geosciences side. Um, what happens to groundwater um, during extreme weather conditions, such as storm surge and intensified wave, wave conditions? Um, like, what, what is uh, going to change in the metrics that we're studying? And uh, for the engineering side of the question, uh, how do we develop a low-cost uh, modular sensor network that collects the required data to answer this question? And so in the next slide, um, Charlie is going to present a solution for the engineering side of the question. Great. So this is an overview of the sensor network that we are constructing. This is a diagram of what we have going on here. Uh, in this picture, uh, we can see the representation of two nodes uh, and a base station. Uh, this is an arbitrary number. It could be different, different numbers of nodes. Um, but the idea is these nodes are self-contained units that are out in the field that have sensors that are collecting the data, and they can use their radio communications to bring that data back to uh, the base station where it can uh, be processed and uploaded to the internet for, for scientists to, to look at. And uh, to, to really highlight some of the flexibility of this network, I want to zoom in on one particular node here. Um, now, if I label these sensors, I could label them all being four temperature sensors, but the idea here with this network is that that's kind of an arbitrary choice. Uh, just as easily, these could be uh, half temperature and half oxidation reduction potential, or uh, three of them could be conductivity and one could be temperature. Uh, it doesn't even need to be four sensors. The idea here is that uh, we can use whatever sensors uh, within reason. Uh, uh, whatever metrics are, are need to be collected, we can use the right sensors to figure out what's going on in the groundwater, and we can use the right number of nodes and the right positions, et cetera, to, to figure that question out in the way that's, that's most effective, and that's really the, the flexibility that our system offers. Um, now, to start talking about some of the hardware we're using to do this, I'll go back to this picture here. This is kind of like the first picture we had, but uh, we're using, we have pictures of the actual devices. So we can see the base station there is a microcontroller connected to a computer, uh, and then the two nodes are microcontrollers that have um, um, sensor peripherals attached to them. So, uh, and again, that, that sort of modularity of the nodes, the, the flexibility of the system, we can see that highlighted here. These four nodes, doesn't need to be four, but again, these nodes, they could all have different setups. These different colored boards uh, represent different, different metrics that we're collecting, and uh, the four of them here, we see might have some that are all one metric, one that have a, just a couple sensors, one that has a wide variety, uh, and all of these nodes can coexist in one network and, and can really gather whatever data is needed to answer the scientific question we're looking at. Um, now, I want to talk about how we, we chose the particular devices we're going to look at, uh, and I want to start with the Feather 32U4 uh, with low raw radio. So this is a, an Arduino-compatible microcontroller made by Adafruit. Uh, their whole platform, the Feather 32U4 platform, uh, has built-in support for a battery, um, and then the particular one we're using has a built-in uh, radio module. So uh, this device is small. It's easy to use uh, because you can program it with Arduino, uh, with the Arduino IDE, and, and with uh, easy to use code. And the uh, the built-in battery makes it easy to make the remote deployment. The whole thing is small and compact uh, and easy to put out in the field. Uh, it was an it was an easy choice for us just because we needed to have something small that could that could use a radio. Uh, another another one is the Raspberry Pi that we're using for the computer uh, at the base station. We just needed something that could run some Python code to analyze and uh, and collect our data. And you know it's nice and small and lightweight, so it was a it was a good choice for for us. We'll just put it um, in like a ranger station or somewhere dry where it can have uh, an internet connection and power, uh, and then it can just receive the messages and do a little bit of processing and then put that right up into the cloud. Uh, and now this 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 last technology is really one of the things that really allows us to have this flexibility. So these are uh, ESO boards uh, from Atlas Scientific. These boards really take uh, the, the hard questions of how do you how do you take a digital uh, measurement of the analog world, uh, and how do you do that in a way that's that's easy to use? I mean, there's tons of scientific literature on, on how to do good uh, science for measuring things, uh, but the short answer is it's complicated and uh, it's a bit beyond the scope of 
of people who, who are just trying to write some code. And so these devices come with all the uh, electronics and all the equipment needed to, to measure uh, and operate the sensors. And they present themselves as a device that we can communicate uh, with uh, on a bus, uh, an I2C communication bus. And the microcontroller can just uh, send a message to one of them saying, hey, I'd like a reading. And it can reply with uh, reading and text. So something like a temperature sensor, we can just say, I'd like a reading. And then it says, oh, it's 23.67 degrees centigrade. Uh, and we can we can easily use that for, for processing. So these, these boards uh, really make it easy for us. And that's sort of how we get that modularity. We can switch them out uh, on the fly. Whatever setup we need to make these nodes, we can put the right boards in there and plug in the right sensors. And it makes it very straightforward for us to, to collect the data. Uh, now, of course, I made it sound like it's all been easy. But if I talk about some of the challenges, there, of course, are um, some things we faced when we're, we're working with these. So if I go back to these Atlas Scientific boards, they are uh, easy to use. But uh, to take an accurate reading of something like electrical conductivity, for instance, you, you need to compensate for the temperature of the water uh, that, is, that, that is currently around the sensor. And so to make an accurate reading, we need to make sure that we have a temperature sensor nearby that can, that can compensate that. Um, we need to make sure that if we have multiple of these sensors on one node, that the, the microcontroller can figure out uh, which, which one pairs with which. Um, so we've had to develop a, a scheme for how to address the devices so that on startup, the, the node can discover what is, what is plugged into it and figure out how to, how to make those uh, links uh, internally so that it can correctly, um, correctly offset the readings uh, and everything so that these boards can do that correctly for us. Uh, so that was one challenge, and we're still working to implement that. Um, we, have a, we have a plan for that. Uh, another one that was really challenging was that we wanted to measure pressure, but we could not find a suitable, uh, a suitable pressure sensor at the hobbyist level. We found um, some, some hobbyist or, or like, uh, I wouldn't say amateur, but some, some you know, uh, sensors that were in a similar price range, similar quality to the Atlas Scientific ones that we were using uh, to measure pressure, but they were not really designed for underwater use. Uh, they were difficult to waterproof or impossible to waterproof, and so uh, we weren't, they weren't really applicable, and we, we struggled to find uh, one of those that was, uh, that, was, that was good for our needs. So we had to uh, find a more expensive uh, and more industrial grade water, uh, water like pressure measuring sensor that's designed to actually be submerged. Um, and then because that was our like a custom thing, we had, to, we had to write our own sort of interface for that. So a device that we can talk to that actually does some of the electronics um, to take a reading from that pressure sensor. Uh, and so that was, that was a challenge, but that's uh, the thing we've most recently worked out. We've managed to find this pressure sensor and, and, and develop the, the necessary glue logic sort of between the pressure sensor and the microcontroller um, so they can talk to each other. And so that's, uh, that's where we're at with the pressure sensor. Uh, and, and having done that, we do have uh, minimum viable products. So I want to talk about uh, where we're at currently with the project. Uh, and essentially, the great thing is if we go back to this schematic, we do have uh, full data flow. If we have data going to the sensor, uh, the sensor is able to communicate back to the microcontroller and uh, bring that data up to the node. The node is able to use its radio and communicate that data over to the base station, which is connected to the Raspberry Pi. And it can, it can uh, grab that data and send it up to the cloud. Uh, and here is a graph that we, that we did using, uh, using a test that we were doing. So this was in our lab bench. Uh, we set up a temperature sensor on, on our bench with, a, with a one node and a couple of sensors. But this is just a temperature reading. Um, and we can see a graph here of the temperature over, over uh, 24 hours uh, over the span of two days. We can see a big spike at the beginning where uh, my coworker held on to the sensor for a couple minutes. And you can see how that brought the temperature right back up. And then it came down. You can see the ambient temperature in the room, um, how it kind of rose after they turned off the AC in the middle of the night, and then right back down again at about 6 in the morning uh, when they turned the AC back on uh, in the building. So that's kind of interesting. And that really highlights, we think, what, what our, our system is capable of. It's a, it's a nice demonstration that we're actually able to get that full data flow. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it off to Grace to talk a little bit about some of the related work and some of the other sensor networks that are, are being developed or have been developed and, and how they stack up against our network and what we think sets ours apart. Thank you, Grace. Um, so yes, as Charlie mentioned, there have been other um, efforts to create environmental monitoring systems such as ours, but until now, um, nothing has achieved all four of the major goals that we mentioned at the beginning of our talk. Um, open source, low cost, scalable, flexible. Um, 
there have been systems that have achieved flexibility, but not much else. Um, let's look at the Aquatrol 600, for example. Um, the cost of one device, uh, the one uh, node device is $3,500. And um, this is without sensors. And we've been able to achieve um, the same functionality for 100 times cheaper with the out of fruit feather. Um, there have been on the converse um, systems that are open source, low cost, and scalable, but lack the flexibility of um, being able to um, use a wide range of uh, sensors and numbers of uh, sensors. So let's look at some examples of that. Um, in essence, uh, the other Arduino sensor network deployments uh, have had different research interests. And overall, they've yielded uh, much less data and much less metrics, uh, data about much less metrics. So um, for example, there was um, a cave investigation from Beddoes et al. And uh, they only focused on three uh, metrics, pressure, uh, temperature, and conductivity. Um, so it was sort of a smaller scale project. And um, also, they um, did not have have a modularized system like what we're trying to achieve and they also um, it wasn't wireless um, and also um, there was a soil monitoring project um, from Payero et al where um, the only metric that they cared about was the moisture content of the soil and um, a seismic reading project from Solar Lorenz where um, similarly only one uh, um, metric was collected, uh, the acceleration of the ground movement. So I'm going to pass it off to Joel, who's going to conclude the talk and tell you about what our next steps are. Okay, thank you very much, Grace. And now I will do exactly those things. So first of all, now that we have a minimum viable product, we next have to take some steps to harden our system. And in order to do that, we have several different kind of categories of tests that we want to do. First of all, we need to make sure that we actually can communicate in the kind of range that we want to, and that we can actually communicate across the beach and you know from like what 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 are the actual parameters for deployment. Uh, so first, we we want to determine the communication range, and we also want to see if they actually are resistant to weather. Uh, we have this idea that they're going to be waterproof and that they're, they're going to be submerged, partially submerged in beaches and in groundwater. So we need to actually do some real world tests to make sure that that's actually true. Uh, first, we're thinking of doing a river test. Uh, the Merrimack River is very close to our lab, so you do one nearby, then maybe at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, perhaps, which is a little further away, but a little more realistic. And that, that'll feed into, uh, that's similar to our actual deployment environment, which I will get to in a minute. And of course, the third category is software stability. We don't want some calculation or some counter or something to be just slightly off in a way that, you know, over months and months, it turns out that all our data was useless the entire time. So we need to actually make sure that the software works, which is just as important as the other two. Because then we want to actually deploy our system, because we want to go hurricane hunting. That is the initial deployment of our system. We want to install our sensor network around two to three months before the hurricane season in Duck, North Carolina at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Research Facility. So first we want to get kind of a baseline control data set. That's why we want to install a few months before, and then once the hurricane season actually starts, we can gather an experimental data set, and then from that contrast, to be able to build uh, a data a model of what kind of changes are actually occurring, how the climate is changing, how these metrics are actually being uh, affected by general changes to the climate. Because that's really what science is about these days. We just want to gather large amounts of data, and then run algorithms on it. So that's what we want to do. We want to scale the data set and then draw conclusions from there. And so now, 
just to give a brief overview of what we discussed, we've gone over the scientific problem that we know that the climate is changing and there are many different granular aspects of that change that we just don't understand, that we just don't have enough data to really make accurate conclusions about. And so that's what we're doing. We just want to gather lots and lots of data using a scalable, low-cost, modular sensor network. And of course, where we are today is that we have the data flow and we have the chips working and talking to each other and we want to harden the system and iterate on it and improve it to the point where we can actually start gathering these large data sets. And so finally, I will conclude with a brief demonstration of the system. And so we do not have our sensor network set up here, but we do have a small deployment going on at our laboratory. And so just as a reminder, uh, here's our architecture. And I have an open SSH session. Ooh, it closed. Okay, I was signed in, but now I'm just going to need to sign it again because leaving it inactive for too long closes the connection. So we have an active data set collection going on. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to get it in first. So now I'm going into school servers, and then from there I'm going into a specific computer where we're actually gathering the data. And now I'm in. And so here we are. Because there's some welcome messages. Uh, is that? No, that's a random loop. Here it is. So here's our data uh, being gathered in real time. Unfortunately, there was some connection that fell out, and so the data ends uh, like at around 10:20 last night. But you know, before that, I was saving around every five minutes. And so, as you can see, we have timestamps. And then we have a, a node ID and then a sensor ID. Say like this, you know, so like 68 represents the temperature, which is unplugged, so it didn't actually work. Uh, we have C7 represents the battery life, and so that represents it in uh, the millivolts. It's like a, it's a it's yeah. analog digital. Yeah, it's like this analog digital conversion thing. It's, it's not the most straightforward number, honestly. Uh, and then another one I think is measuring uh, conductivity, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you know, there's not really much that's being conducted. You know, there's no water. <laughs> so, but you know, it's gathering data. Did you say that you guys you were putting on like a this time what you were looking Which aspect? The, the numbers themselves. So what was the machine identifier? What did you use it after that? Oh, okay. So we have, yeah, we have the, the, the node identifier for some particular feather device. And then we have uh, IDs for the particular sensors on the nodes. So here for seven, we have this is a representation of battery life. Uh, it's using kind of weird units, so it's it's not uh, it's not entirely straightforward to convert that to, to volts or something. Uh, and then yeah, uh, and then here this one was uh, this temperature. Unfortunately, it was unplugged, so it's giving us a little error value. Uh, that's what we attempted to do was go and plug in the temperature sensor, and then there was a there was an error in kind of connectivity, but. We still do have the data. So it's three numbers are six seven, six eight, six nine. Yeah. Three distinct sensors. Yes. Yep. And those numbers are the sensor types. Yeah, those those depending on what type they are, that's how you determine those numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So using that, we have a, a mapping of the uh, sensor IDs to the actual sensor types and the units, and then with that, you know, we can process this text file and um, process the data. I mean, so what are those temperatures showing the heat depth, heat depth of the universe at negative degrees? Yeah, that's a hardware error. <laughs> so you said one was a battery, device, one was a battery, what was the other sensor that you uh, electrical conductivity, uh, although I think that uh, it's dependent. Oh no, it's oxidation reduction potential. Yeah. So, if we're uh, going to start um, questions, uh, I, I don't want to. Oh yeah, no, wait, that's you. that's what I was going to say in ten seconds from what I was saying. But uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, without further ado, can open it up to questions. Uh, so yeah, any questions? Yeah, so um, as people ask questions, please do raise your hands. I'll get the mic to you. And if you can, if you're not near the end of an aisle, please move to one. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. All right. 
Hey guys, so I just had a question about, um, so your node, your sensor nodes here, the idea was that they're running on um, battery eventually, right? So I was just curious, did you come up with a, a power budget yet? I know that um, a lot of these sensors can be particularly power hungry, so you might have to think about putting into sleep states and stuff like that. Yep, that's absolutely something we're working on. So um, I, I, for whatever reason, there's a photo that didn't show up, but uh, the, the big concern is uh, when writing the code, how do we make sure we're putting devices in a low power and sleep state where possible? Um, these Atlas Scientific ESO sensors support uh, built-in sleep uh, mode. Uh, and so we just have to make sure whenever we ask them for reading, we then just say, okay, now go back to sleep. And we also had to investigate how to put the microcontroller into a, uh, into a sort of a deeper sleep. Um, and so, yeah, we're we're using we're using both of those to to minimize the power usage. Uh, and what the test that we that we're running right now is actually was a battery life test. Um, and so, I guess uh, we'd hope that we finish sooner so we could bring the system here. But uh, it went a little bit longer. I guess we have more battery life than we'd expected. Uh, and so, we can only show you the the data from where it's still being collected. Uh, but yeah, that's a big concern: is is how do we how do we make sure we're we're not using enough, uh, not using too much power, and how do we how do we conserve that so we can go for the, the couple of months that we want to collect the data. So that's, that's really a great question. And also um, for other uh, Arduino sensor networks, um, solar energy has been implemented. Um, so that's something that we could look into as well. Do we have any further questions? Uh, what's your plan for the, on the schematic? You show them going into the ground. How deep do you see them going? And are you actually going to be digging them out? Are you going to get some machinery where you want to be? What's your plan for getting the sensors into the ground? Yeah. So uh, uh, short answer is we're the software people. Um, so uh, you talk to our uh, our, our dear uh, colleague, uh, Mr. James Heiss. But the gist of it is, I believe we're looking for a deployment of maybe between mm, five to ten, maybe even down to fifteen meters or so, um, and just at different different depths uh, and placing the sensors in there and then uh, measuring the water. I mean, because it's, it's right near the beach, and so even if you're only 5 or 10 meters down, uh, you're, you're starting to run into, obviously, like beach water and, and groundwater from the aquifer. And, and really, like, we're looking at that interface between them um, and how that changes. So we we can measure, like, essentially how much of that water at that depth is, is sort of uh, how salty is it and other things like that to really understand where we're at in that mixing um, and obviously how that changes in response to the things we're trying to we're trying to investigate. Yeah. How long is the uh, program expected to run for? So uh, we want to have like an initial deployment of two to three months uh, plus another deployment for the summer. So around five to six months total is is our target. Yeah, yeah, yeah in two stages. So maybe with a change of battery in the middle, but the, the software should be able to last that entire period. Okay. Uh, looks like we might be ready to wrap up questions. Uh, certainly, if you have questions that you want to ask face to face, I think you'll, you folks will be able to take uh, those questions outside the conference room. Is that right? Um, all right. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.